Okay, so just a little bit of info before I get into the story. I, 22 male, work construction and run a few crews, and I'm a foreman because I've been working in this field since I started working summers when I was 14. That's legal in my state. With this being said, I have a lot of experience and get paid really well. For my job, I need a truck that can pull a lot of trailers and also get into a lot of sketchy job sites, especially in the winter. So I drive a new lifted pickup 350. Anyways, let's get into it. So about four months ago now, I got off work one day and just really didn't feel like making dinner. So I decided to go get myself the trusty Big Mac at McDonald's. Well, after I got my order, I was going to pull out into the parking lot to drive home, and I was looking hard over to my left to see how busy the road was before I got over there. Well, I wasn't paying great attention to what was happening in front of me, and as I was creeping forward, someone who was in front of me was stopped and not paying attention either. I ended up barely hitting his mirror and scraping his door with my front end. I immediately reversed and hopped out. I made sure the guy was okay and apologized knowing it was my fault, and I asked him if he wanted to call the cops. Let's call him Brent, Brent says. Nah, bro, we are all good. If you just get me your insurance info, I think we can get this taken care of. I was fine with that, as there was no damage done to my truck, and it's not required to call the cops for an accident if it occurs in a private parking lot. This is relevant later. We exchange info, and he seems pretty cool. So I tell him to go get the damage bid and I'll just pay in cash so my insurance rates don't go up as long as he's okay with it. He says that's fine and we both just leave and I feel like a jerk, but all in all, Brent seems like a cool dude and I just hope we can get it sorted out smoothly. About a month passes by and I haven't heard anything from Brent or the shop I told him to go to. Honestly, I wasn't too stressed about this because if he decided to not get it done, that's on him. Well... He called me up one day at about noon saying he can't remember my name and he wanted to tell the guys at the shop who was the person who sent him there. I told him my name and the guys at the shop gave him a deal. He sends me the bid for damages and it comes out to $2403. This was more than I imagined, but I said to get it done and I'd take care of the bill afterward and that was that. He hung up and said it was cool and I went on with my day as usual. Another month goes by, and I don't hear anything until Brent calls me up while I'm at work again and says, Hey, Brotha, I talked to the shop, and they said they can't get me in for another two weeks or so, and they may end up charging me more if they find more damage. I say, Okay, sounds good. Just let me know, man. I hope it goes smooth for you, and I'm sorry for the inconvenience. He seems to take it well, and I'm really trying to just be a good person. He responds with, Well, after talking to my wife, I'm okay if you just wanted to write a check for $2,500 and we can call it even. This seemed odd to me, because why the hell wouldn't someone want their vehicle repairs all paid for? I said, okay, man, let's set a time and place to meet and I'll get you paid. He liked the idea and ended the call by telling me he would let me know. Yet another month passes by and I hear nothing again. At this point, I'm getting fed up and just want this situation to stop being over my head. He hits me up at 11 p.m. one night and asks if we can meet in town. I found this kind of disrespectful because I was nearly asleep and had to be at work at 5 a.m. the next day. Either way, I said that was fine and took my $2,500 cash and wrote up a quick contract saying the payment would be accepted as payment in full for the damages and by accepting it, it would release me from any and all liability. This was a pretty fair contract, I believe, as it was the deal we had already made over the phone, just in writing. I get to the place we suggested as a meetup spot. I give him the cash and he signs the contract without hardly even reading it, and he didn't want the copy. This was a red flag to me, but I just assumed he really didn't care about it all that much. So I just sent him the photo of the contract and went back home for some beauty sleep. As you can guess by now, another month goes by with me just living life carefree and not worrying about this car accident anymore. Well, I go to check my mail and I have a notice from this guy's lawyer that he is suing me for not paying after wrecking his car. This got me so mad, but I also knew I had plenty of text messages and a contract on my side. I immediately call Brent and he blocks my number. Luckily enough, my girlfriend works for a lawyer, so I get him updated and he says he'd love to help. He lets me know I saved myself by writing that contract as any contract worth over $500 is to be held up in any level court in my state. 
I immediately get to work on my revenge. I remember on the side of this guy's car he had a business logo, and I took pictures of the damage, so I hop online and get to the BBB to look up who owns this company, thinking that surely he couldn't own the business because he is such an idiot. I was wrong. This guy owns the company, and I can see that he has about 12 one-star reviews all in dispute because of his shady business practices telling people it will cost one thing and then charging them four times what he said it would. Sounds familiar? Remember when he said the shop may charge more than the original $2,400? That's right, he was suing me for $10,000, four times what the shop told him it would cost. Unbelievable. He was trying his same sneaky crap on me. My lawyer takes note of this, and we show up to court ready for war. This guy is sleazy. As we get there and all set up, he says, You ready to give me more of daddy's money? With a smirk. I guess it was just because I'm young and drive a nice truck and could afford $2,500. His lawyer gets up and starts trying to say nonsense about me hitting and running, and Brent barely got a picture of my license plate, so I tried bullying him into taking a deal for only $2,500 when the damage was clearly more than that. There were obvious holes in his story, and he really didn't have much to say. Just imagine the smile on my face as my lawyer lays out the printouts of our text messages and the physical copy of the contract, which was signed by Brent. His lawyer was ghostly white and looked sick. After laying out all of the evidence, my lawyer pulled out a little hidden gem, the printouts of all the complaints we found on the BBB and how he was doing the same thing to me. That was the final nail in the coffin, as the judge said he had seen enough. He asked Brent for any final statements, and Brent said, I don't even have the $2,500 anymore. Can I just get that then and we will be okay? Literally admitting to the judge that he had received my money and his story was just a load of nonsense. I thought his lawyer was gonna strangle him at this point. It was beautiful. The judge ended up ruling in my favor and demanded him to pay my legal fees as well as damages and lost wages because I had to miss work to be in court. The absolute sweetest part was that this particular day my crew was on a very high-wage job and I was technically the one getting paid before I paid them out as subcontractors. This means I was to be paid $475 an hour and this whole ordeal took about five hours. He ended up having to pay me almost $5,000. I don't think I've ever been so happy in my life. About four years ago, I was hired as a contract to hire for a position at a major IT storage vendor. I put in my two-week notice, but then got called by the account manager stating that EMC pushed back my starting date a week. No biggie. I end up getting a week off work, unpaid. So I close out my two weeks, and on Thursday, I'm supposed to start the following Monday. I get a call from the manager of the contract house stating that there was some fraud involving my position and that it didn't exist. I'm like, what the F? They explain that the contract manager basically made up the positions in the hopes of getting paid. Additionally, he ran up over 10 k on the company credit cards. I told them they'd be hearing from my attorney as it was not my fault they didn't have proper checks on their staff and my job was with them, not the end client. My attorney contacts the contract house's insurance company, and they won't start negotiating until my losses can be calculated, landing a new job. So I started my job search in earnest. In addition to looking for a new gig, I begin doing some work around the house, pulling up carpeting, painting, and installing a new laminate floor. Fortunately, and since I knew I'd land a job and I'd get paid for my time off, I was able to borrow some money from my parents to get the stuff done. I start Googling the guy, and of course I find him, on an offender tracking system maintained by our state. I dig a little deeper and find he has an extensive criminal history dating back to the 80s. I start a new gig a month later while my attorney starts negotiating with the contract house's insurance company. They lowball me and I tell them to pound sand. When I forward the information about the contract house hiring a convicted felon, my pay for the job I left, the expenses I incurred, and some smooth words from my attorney about having a sympathetic jury because I left a job I had and was now out of work thanks to negligence on the part of the company they were insured by. They settled for the time I was out of work, which was a month, COBRA, 
the pay at my new contracted rate and miscellaneous expenses related to job-seeking. Part of the agreement was that I would not speak ill of the contract house. And I won't. I really don't have any issues with them as they were honest about their screw-up and made good with me. I paid off my parents with the check. I contacted the contract house again and spoke to the manager. At this point, since things are settled, he apologizes and says that they've changed their procedures, including background checks, as well as fraud checks on their corporate cards. He said the city wouldn't prosecute since the losses weren't large enough or verifiable. I point out that I was out of work for a month. He tells me I'm not the only one. There were 15 other people that were victims of this guy's fraud, and 11 of them put in their notice at their current jobs, including one guy that had moved from California back to the Midwest, the revenge. At this point, I'm mad at this guy. I personally am very good about finding work, but many of these people may not have been so fortunate. He screwed up so many lives with his fraud, and for the recruiting firm, they only lost money. I check this guy's LinkedIn profile a month or two later, and I find he has a new job as an account manager at another recruiting firm. I call the recruiting firm and tell them the story as well as providing them links to his offender status. The manager tells me he just started two weeks prior and he was in orientation. They fired him immediately. He lied on his resume. They didn't perform a background check. They wondered why his resume listed as AHR generalist at the state prison, not knowing he was in the state prison. I'm all for giving people another shot. But this guy has an extensive criminal record with multiple convictions for fraud, theft, B, and E, including A, B, and E, after the entire mess with the last recruiting firm, not to mention multiple stays in state prison. I'm a 15-year-old girl, and one of my closest friends is a 19-year-old girl named C. Our circle also includes C.A.'s boyfriend, Z, and myself. On this particular day, we were joined by Z's friend E, who is 23 years old. Little did we know that this gathering would lead to a harrowing and unexpected turn of events. Prior to this incident, Z had been upset after being unjustly labeled a pedophile by a 14-year-old girl. While it's important to acknowledge that she had her reasons, Z's anger simmered beneath the surface. Seeking solace, Z and E decided to take a stroll through a nearby forest, hoping to shake off the distressing accusation. Unbeknownst to Z and E, I had developed a fascination with the local flora and had conducted extensive research on the plants in our province. It just so happened that one of the plants they stumbled upon was a spotted water hemlock, renowned as one of the most toxic species in our region. Aware of the plant's danger, I urgently warned Z to steer clear and put it down. To my shock and dismay, he disregarded my advice and, defiantly, took a large bite out of the stem. Luckily, due to the plant's lifelessness, some of its toxicity had diminished, but it remained potentially fatal. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, I immediately dialed for an ambulance, realizing that Z's life was at stake. Throughout the night, I stood by Z's side in the hospital, forsaking my own responsibilities, including a missed job opportunity. Z insisted that I remain with him, and despite harboring reservations about his character, I chose to prioritize his well-being. It was an arduous and worrying experience, with the hours ticking away from 6 p.m. to 11.30 p.m., but his life took precedence. My apprehension towards Z stemmed not only from his aggressive nature, but also from his previous questionable interactions with minors. This unfortunate incident had only further fueled my doubts and unease about his behavior. Now, a month and a half has passed since that fateful night, just three days ago, while spending time with C and Z. Once again, Z revealed that his parents were demanding that I cover the expenses for the ambulance. I vehemently refused, stating that I would not shoulder the financial burden of saving their son's life. Personally, I firmly believe that Z should bear the responsibility of the ambulance bill. He is a 23-year-old adult, while I am a 15-year-old girl who, against my better judgment, stepped in to save him after he deliberately ignored my warning. As far as I know, Z's parents are persistently pursuing me to settle the bill, but unless a court determines me liable, I am resolved to dismiss their unreasonable demands. Their relentless pursuit has only served to further strain an already tenuous relationship. 